All right, the title for my sermon this morning is Bible Prophecies Fulfilled. And um, I've been kind of excited about preaching this. There's a lot, there's so much in the Bible when it comes to just prophecies that, that were made, prophecies that were said that came to pass. There's prophecies that were given way, way early on in, in, in human history by, by prophets of old that came to pass hundreds, even thousands of years later. And then there's some that happened in even, even a very short period of time within a lifetime, within a few days, within a week, whatever. So there's all different types of prophecies. I'm probably going to be making a little, maybe like a mini series out of this on various aspects of Bible prophecies. But one of the things that I was blown away by, it's, it's one of those things that you know to be true, at least for me, it was something I knew to be true. Obviously, I know that there's a lot of Bible prophecies that, that have come to pass. But when you take a step back and you start looking at it and you start just, just what, what are the Bible prophecies? What are prophecies? What are the things that, that men have said, men of God have said that came to pass? It's just literally all throughout the Bible. I mean, the Bible is riddled with things that were spoken before they happened and came to pass and happened. And in, you don't have to turn there, but in Deuteronomy 18, the question is basically answered of, well, how do we know whether somebody says, hey, I'm a prophet from God, thus saith the Lord, right? This is what God says, because anybody can say that. Deuteronomy 18.21 says, And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So the false prophet is, is marked or known by the things that they say not coming to pass. Because obviously, if they say something that doesn't come to pass, God didn't say that because everything that God says does come to pass. God is a God of his word. I mean, there's, there's nothing, you know, more almost like holy or sanctified than, than God's word. It is without error. It is without um, um, contradiction. It is, you know, when God says something, it is so. God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, God made the entire creation based on his words. Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. I mean, there's so much to God's Word. So when we're looking at this, that is one way of knowing when... He, and the way, notice this is knowing the negative, knowing when there's a false prophet, knowing when someone, when God has not said that. Because obviously you could have some people where they might say something, you know, if, if you guess a hundred times, maybe you'll get one thing right. You know what I mean? But that doesn't mean you just focus on that one thing that they said that was right when they're talking in the name of the Lord. So we look at the prophets of God. We look at Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and all these people. One thing we know about them is they're not saying, you know, we know they're not perfect. So I'm sure they've said things in their lives that were not right, that, that maybe didn't happen the way they thought they were going to happen or whatever. But not when they were saying, thus saith the Lord. Not when they were revealing unto people, hey, this is the message that I got from God and this is what God wants you to know. These people that were prophets of God, they weren't just going around throwing God's name out there anytime they wanted to say something. That's what the false prophet does. They're going to claim they have all this knowledge and wisdom from God and they're not getting it from God. The real prophets know when to say, thus saith the Lord, and when not to say, thus saith the Lord. Because when it's their own opinion, and it's their own whatever, then, then they're not going to be saying, hey, God told me this. A great example of that is, you know, even, even the Apostle Paul, which turned out to be Scripture, but he says, you know, now, you know, what I'm going to say, he was talking about marriage, right? And, and, and those that remain unmarried, you know, virgins versus those that get married. And he's saying, you know what? But, but this I say, not the Lord, right? So he's saying like, like, hey, this is what God says. We need to follow this. This is what the Bible says. You know, the Lord said this, but you know, this is what I say. And he, and he made a very clear distinction when he was going about and saying it. And like I said, that is found in scripture. So I still believe it's the word of God. But, you know, again, that's a whole uh, sermon for another time. But one of the things I found out, and we see this played out in Jeremiah 28, and that's why we started off reading this chapter, because this entire chapter is about um, when the children of Israel were going to be taking, taken captive into Babylon. You had all these other false prophets saying, oh no, God's with us, you know, he's going to deliver us, he's with us, we need to fight against Babylon, and we're, you know, rah, 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 you know, America, we're, you know, no one can beat us. That was the attitude back in, in the days of, uh, of Jeremiah. 
right? In Jerusalem. And, you know, they're, they're like, Jerusalem, right? We're, we're, <laughs> no, no one get us, right? We're, we got God on our side. And Jeremiah's like, no. No, you wicked. You've rejected the Lord. You're serving false gods. You're not, you know, the, the judgment's coming. And what he ends up saying here, and we're not going to reread the chapter. I think, what, you know, reading the chapter prior to service is sufficient um, because I have a lot. I have a lot of scripture reference we're going to go through. And when trying to determine what I was going to preach, I mean, Bible prophecies fulfilled, there's so many. I didn't even touch on this sermon the prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ just being born and his ministry and stuff like that. That's a whole nother sermon or two or three or ten, okay, in and of itself. Um, this, I'm just kind of basically dealing with almost everything. I think I took one thing from the New Testament and everything else is just all these Old Testament scriptures. And I basically kind of picked my favorite ones. The ones that I just really like a lot and I think are really cool and really amazing. So we're going to look at those this morning. And what we saw here in Jeremiah 28 is you got this prophet saying, um, you know, Hananiah, that there's going to be peace. Don't listen to Jeremiah, you know, God's going to push back our enemy and there's going to be peace in our land. And Jeremiah is basically saying, okay, you know what, let that, you know, We'll see who's right. We'll see who's speaking from God because when there's peace, you'll be known by, you know, whether or not you're speaking for God when there is peace. And he goes on to explain how, um, verse 8, it says, The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesieth of peace... When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. He's saying, there's a long history of prophets that preach doom and gloom, and they were men of God. There are many prophets that, that are given the warning from God. And see, this is a good, man, I don't want to get off into all these other subjects, but like, one way of spotting the false prophet is when everything's just roses. Everything is peace, peace. Everything's great. Don't worry. Hell's not that hot. Don't worry. Your sin's not that bad. We're all doing just fine. Keep it up. Ba rah, 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 pep talk. That's when you're going to find the false prophet. Now, look, I'm not saying there's not a time for a pep talk, for, a, for an encouragement, for edifying sermons. But if that's all that's coming out of their mouth and it's just peace, 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 when there is no peace, that's a false prophet. Amen. We need to realize that more of God's word is warning about the negative things than it is, you know, um, rejoicing in all of the positive things. There really is more just warning. Hey, don't turn from God. Don't serve idols. This is what's happening. I mean, read the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Are those the most uplifting books you've ever read? No. No. They're all warnings. They're all talking about the consequences of turning from God. All of them. And that's like the entire books. And that's the major prophets that, that make up a big chunk of the Bible. So and again, I'm not saying there's not great stuff in the Bible and reasons to rejoice. Of course there are. But we need to have a good balance and, and preach the full counsel of God. So he's saying this. He's like, you know, many prophets before me, they've, they preach the same messages that I'm preaching to you now. No, God hasn't changed. He still feels the same way about your sin. He still feels the same way about this stuff. And, and this is what's going to happen. Then it says, look at verse number 10. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's neck and break it. So Jeremiah's trying to prove a point with this yoke saying, hey, you're going into bondage, right? You guys are going to be brought under and be serving. But, and, and he's illustrating that by putting this yoke on his neck. And then it says in verse 11, And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. I bet that got him a lot of cheers, too. People are like, Oh, yeah, you get him. You know, you broke that. You know, like, like God's with us. And, and probably a real charismatic guy, right? Someone who's really able to motivate the people. But guess what? He was still a false prophet. Right. No matter how many people might have been happy and excited. Oh, yeah, you know, you broke that yoke. You know, God's going to break that yoke. Jeremiah was the one telling the truth. Verse 12, Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet. After that, Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet 
Jeremiah saying, look, God wasn't pleased about this. God sees what's happening. And look what he says, because God tells Jeremiah, he said, okay, here's what I want you to say now. Verse number 13, go and tell Hananiah, saying, thus saith the Lord, thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. God's bringing it down harder now on them than it would have been if he would have just shut his stupid mouth and, and you know, listen to the word of the Lord. Now he's saying, yeah, you know what? Those were wood. But now, because you want to go and, and, and uh, deceive all the people there, it's going to be yokes of iron. Verse 14, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also. Verse 15, Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie, which is exactly what it was. Verse 16, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die. And this is pretty amazing. He's just saying, you know what? I'm calling it. You're going to die this year because of your preaching of lies. Because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. Look at verse 17. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. So we come to the first prophecy that we see directly fulfilled. Now, obviously, we know in, in, the, in the scheme of things what Jeremiah is already preaching about the children of Israel going into bondage, being taken captive by Babylon. That came to pass. And we also know that the popular thing at the time, what, the, what the, the majority of the public believed in was that they weren't going into captivity. They thought they had a good defense. They thought that they would be able to stand strong against Babylon and against Nebuchadnezzar. So the people of the world at that time were thinking, this ain't going to happen. But Jeremiah, against the odds, against what the, the majority of people would say in a poll of what's going to happen to us, said, no, you are going captive. And we know through history that they were taken captive. We know the whole story. Obviously, we have the biblical account, which is another prophecy fulfilled. Let's turn to our next prophecy. Turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. And, you know, I'm going to tell you to go to a couple places at once because we're going to see prophecies and then prophecy fulfilled. So 1 Kings 13, and then we're going to go to 2 Kings 23. This is probably one of, besides the prophecies of Jesus, one of my all-time favorite prophecies in the Bible. And this is regarding Josiah the king. Josiah was an awesome king. Josiah was the last righteous king of Judah before they got taken captive. Um, <clears throat> he, had, he had turned his heart to serve God. He got the Sodomites out of the land. He went through. They had this great Passover feast. I mean, they, he did so many things to just try to get things back right with God because when he realized how screwed up they had gotten because they weren't even using the Bible anymore. He's like, hey, repair the house of the Lord. They're like, hey, look. Look what we found in the house of the Lord. Look at this thing. Oh, it's the word of God. He's like, ah, oh, read it to me. You know, Wow! Our forefathers really screwed up. What are we doing here? This is crazy. We got to get right with God. And, and he did. And, and he's an awesome king. But King Josiah, look at 1 Kings 13, verse number 1. This is all, and remember, he was one of the last kings before they were taken captive. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat was the king of is the first king of Israel after the split of the kingdom. So you had King Saul, King David, King Solomon with a united kingdom. When the kingdom transferred to Solomon's son Rehoboam, that is when God judged all of Solomon's sins and turning to the false god and gave one part unto David's house for David's sake. And then the rest of the kingdom was rent away, was stripped away from him. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the one that was ordained of God to be the king over Israel. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was worried that he was going to lose control of his nation and that they were all going to go back to serve the house of David, to go and just fall under the reign of Rehoboam, that they'd kind of change their minds. So because he was worried about this and didn't trust in God, didn't trust that God had, had made him leader and that, and that things were going to work out because God said so, he decided to build these two graven images and said, these be your gods. 
And the reason being is that he didn't want them to go back to Jerusalem. He didn't want them to go serve there because he thought that, you know, their heart's still going to be over there and they're going to end up going back to him. So I'm just going to keep them here and say, okay, serve your gods right here. Serve these, gold, you know, these, these false idols. Major sin. He's kind of used as one of the standards of how wicked a king is when you're going through the, the books of the Kings and Chronicles of, of how, like, you know, he was evil and wicked, but he didn't, he didn't do, attain to the, to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. You know, like he was one of those bad standards in the Bible. But what we see here in 1 Kings 13 is when he's just building these altars. Like it's, it's at the beginning still roughly of his reign when he's doing these things. So God sends a man of God to rebuke him. And the man of God prophesied. So let's, let's, let's start reading here in verse number 1 of 1 Kings 13. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Now, what I love about this prophecy is a couple things. One, he names the name. He's like, there's going to be a guy born of the house of David, so in that lineage, and his name's going to be Josiah. Now, we know in the kingly line, there's no other Josiah that was, that was reckoned in the, in the king line, right? We don't, I mean, maybe there is some other Josiah somewhere else along the way as a descendant of David. I don't know. You know, very possible it could have been. But not along the king line did we ever have anyone um, come along with that name Josiah until approximately 340 years after this event. I did a rough calculation of this. 300, I mean, think about 340 years. We're in 2017. How long ago was 340 years? 16... I don't know, I'm, not, I'm not that quick on the math this morning. So in the 1600s. So someone in the 1600s were to say, there's going to be a guy born and he's gonna, his name's going to be Donald Trump and he's going to, you know, <laughs> whatever, right? Like, like, like just saying, this is going to be his name and this is what he's going to do. And I am not saying Donald Trump's a saver. Please don't get me wrong. Okay, uh, 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 far from it. Far from it. Okay, I'm just trying to illustrate a point of just someone from the 1600s being able to name any name, saying there, this is going to be a na his name, and this is what he's going to do. This very altar that you're breaking, he's going to burn the priest's bones upon it and break it down and destroy it and get rid of it. And we see now in 2 Kings 23 that that's exactly what happened. 2 Kings 23, verse 15, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made. Both that altar and the high place he broke down and burned the high place and stamped it small to power, powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mountain, sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these words. What an awesome fulfillment of prophecy after hundreds of years that the very, I mean, to the letter, nothing was left undone of what the man of God prophesied would happen. Now, a lot of people will be saying, oh, well, that didn't happen, right? The, you know, in this time, you're thinking, well, I don't see anyone named Josiah coming in and tearing down the, the altar that Jeroboam set up, you know, and, and just mocking, just like they're doing now with, oh, yeah, when's Jesus coming back, right? The Bible says in the last days there shall be scoffers and people are going to mock at, at, oh, where's the return of Jesus? I thought he was coming quickly, right? Well, where is he then? I had someone at the door outside and say, well, where, where is your Jew? Yeah, it was pretty blasphemous. I, I, don't, I don't remember everything they said. I kind of just like, okay, you'll see. You know, like, right. when you have that type of an attitude, what, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. She's obviously heard and rejected and, and hates God with, with that type of an attitude, um, just being extremely blasphemous. But that's the type of attitude some people have. They say, okay, well, we'll see. We'll see what's going to come to pass. We'll see if God's word comes to pass. Right. We have a huge history of God's word coming to pass. And that's what we're looking at this morning. So turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to see this another prophecy of Jericho, the city Jericho. 
So one of the first cities that was destroyed when the children of Israel came out of, e came out of Egypt and then were going into the promised land and um, they had this battle of Jericho. So keep one finger in 1 Kings 16. I probably should have told you that first. And then the other one in Joshua 6. We're going to look at Joshua chapter 6 first. We're going to look at the prophecy and then we're going to look at the fulfillment of the prophecy. Joshua chapter 6 verse 26 the Bible reads, And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So he's saying, this city is cursed. You know, they destroyed it. They knocked down the walls of Jericho. I remember they would turn around it seven times. They had that great victory. They destroyed it. And he says, you know what? This city is going to be a curse. And anyone that comes after here and wants to build this city, he's going to pay for it dearly with the price of his children. He says he's going to lay the foundation in his firstborn and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. Two children are going to be lost for whoever decides to come back and rebuild this city. 1 Kings chapter 16. Mind you, now this is going to be very roughly, I didn't, I didn't bother to go through all the timing on this, roughly 500 years later. Very rough estimate, but I mean it's probably more than that. Because you think about the, uh, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, you had Moses and Joshua, right? Joshua helped to conquer and they, they finally got into the land. Then you had the time of the judges, right? Which spanned hundreds of years. And then you get into the point to where we're at here where we're kind of midway through the reigns of the kings in 1 Kings chapter 16. So again, I mean, it's really, really rough map, but, but it's a long time. Okay? It's a really long time has passed. Uh, 1 Kings 16 verse 34, in his days did he heal the Bethelite, build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now imagine this. You've got this guy, Hiel, you know, coming in. He's, I'm going to build this city, right? You probably had some people, and I'm, I'm conjecturing, you probably had some people saying, don't do it. You know, that city's cursed, which is why it hasn't been built in the past 500 years, right? No one wants to do it because everyone's fearing the Lord. This guy's saying, whatever, you know, I'm going to build this city. What, you, what the God's going to do something to me for building a city? You know, like you could, you could probably sense his attitude. And sure enough, we get the names. Hey, Abiram is firstborn. Died when he laid the foundation. And there's probably some accident and, you know, probably still didn't click with them that that was from God. Right, probably explain it because you know the world's gonna explain away all these prophecies that get fulfilled, anyways. Right. I mean, they're gonna find some excuse to say, "Well, that wasn't God." Exactly. There's always a reason to just say, "Oh, God's miracles." Yeah, that's not a miracle. Yep. And but then when you get to the second son, right, the youngest one, a lot of people are going, "Wow, there's God's word coming true once again." Every single time you got the word of God, it's being fulfilled. And that's amazing. I mean, this is, we talk about the, the span of years that have gone by. And like I said, we're not even getting into all of the prophecies of Jesus Christ this morning. That's a whole nother, and that's, like I said, I'm going to try to, I, I need to figure out how I want to get through that one because I don't want to just have this, this super long running uh, a series on, on that, even though it might be kind of fun. Um, turn, if you would, to... Turn, if you would, to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. We're going to spend quite a bit of time there. I'm just going to read you. This is the one that I got from the New Testament because I, I was kind of just preparing this with just various things that came to my mind of just like, what, were the, what are the prophecies, right? What, what are the things that, that I remember that's, that's just I want to go over th uh, this morning? Um, I'll read for you in Matthew 24, verse 1. The Bible says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And of course, we know that that prophecy came true. And this is one of the, the only prophecy I have, I have in here. Um, and, and again, that's where you can see how I could take this in so many different directions. That this is, even, this is just proven from secular history. We know that in 70 AD that the temple was destroyed. We know that that happened. And we know that today the temple still does not, there's still not one stone upon another. 
that hasn't been cast out. And we could see that with our eyes that that's happened. And Jesus prophesied that back in, uh, in, in his lifetime. So there is, there are other, and see what I'm doing now is because I preach the Bible, we're, we're, I'm, you could say, oh, you're proving your prophecies fulfilled from the same book. Yeah, I am. I am. It's the word of God. And, but that does not discount the accuracy or the validity in any way, even from a secular standpoint, of the accounts that were written down, especially when you're crossing generations. When you have Joshua was not written at the same time of the chronicles of the kings of Israel or the, you know, those books that were chronicling just events that happened throughout that history. And there's, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to answer all the dumb arguments, but the truth stand the test of time and they stand scrutiny under the, um, um, the world's methodolo methodologies even of determining historical accuracies of the, content, of the content of the book. And none of the things that we're even really looking at are miracles per se in the, you know, like the healing or raising people from the dead or things like that. This is just, I mean, these are events that happened. Like uh, Heil that, that lost his two children. That's a historical fact that happened. And it just so happens to fulfill a prophecy that was spoken 500 years earlier. Genesis 15. You could do an entire sermon on just Abraham alone in the amount of prophecies we see fulfilled. Genesis 15 has multiple prophecies all just within the context of this one chapter. So we're going to look at these uh, real briefly. Look at verse number 4, Genesis 15, 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So this was at the time before Isaac was born. And Abraham's just praying unto God saying, Look, there's, you know, I got the servant who I'm kind of raising as a son but he's not my physical son. You know, can he bless, you know, is he going to be my heir? Is he going to be the one that inherits, you know, everything I'm working for here and doing for you? And God says no. Now we know that God gives him Isaac in his old age when it's already like impossible for Sarah to conceive. And she does. And it's a miracle, right? And he gives and he comes true on his word. And then he says, you know, hey, go, go ahead, look up at the stars. Tell me if you can count all those stars. And he says, that's how your seed is going to be, your descendants. That is a, you count those, then you'll be able to count how many children you end up having you know, through, through his line. And we know, historically, that Abraham had you know, only Isaac, right? Isaac had Jacob and Esau, right? But then you have Jacob had you know, 12 sons, and you have Esau had his children and, and, and just multiplied on the face of the earth to where you could say, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's true. You count, the, you count the stars, you could count how many descendants literally came from, from, uh, from Abraham. But let's, let's jump down here now to verse number 13. The Bible says, and he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Very specific prophecy given to Abraham from God. Your children, they're going to be a stranger, they're going to be a foreigner in another land that's not their land, and they're going to serve them. They're going to be brought into a bondage. They're going to be afflicted for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. So we know, we all know the story of, of the children of Israel. You know, there's the famine. They go, you know, Joseph is raised up to, to be, and that's, I have Joseph in here also as, as another prophecies being fulfilled through the life of Joseph. And um, I, I don't think I was going to go through much of his life just because, I mean, I have to cut it off somewhere, right? But even the fact of Joseph and the dreams that he had and his, and his brother, you know, his brother and his parents, you know, the, the sun, the moon, the stars bowing down, basically making obeisance to him. And he had these dreams where when he was younger, this was going to happen. 
They wanted to kill him. They tried to kill him. Instead, they sold him into slavery and they sent him off. Said, yeah, right, we'll see what happens if your dreams now. Good luck being a slave in Egypt. Well, through a very, very peculiar course of events, what happens? <laughs> Joseph's running the land, second only to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's basically in, in name only, pretty much, the, you know, the, the ruler of the land. And the famine comes, and guess who's bowing down before Joseph, asking for bread? Prophecy fulfilled again. Now, as a result of that fulfillment of prophecy, that brings the children of Israel into the land of Egypt. And, and, and you see, individually, these are all amazing. Now start stacking them together and fitting them into how it all plays out. And you've got undeniable word of God. I mean, there is just no doubt about it. There is no way you can have all these things start to fit simultaneously. And, oh, prophecy, 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 fulfill, 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 fulfill along the way without it being of God. So, they come into Egypt. Of course, they're brought into bondage. This is known. This is historical fact also. If you go outside of the Bible, the, children of Israel, the, the, the Jews were, were, in, uh, were, were under bondage in Egypt. And then it says that he's going to judge that nation, which, of course, Moses did. And it says that he was going to bring them out with great substance. I'm just, you don't have to turn there, but in Exodus chapter 12, verse 35, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, all these valuable things, right? Gold, silver, clothing. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. He brought them out of there with great substance. Right? Again, one more aspect of the whole piece of the, the puzzle that, that is being uh, fulfilled here. And then it says in uh, verse 15, here in Genesis 15, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So again, another prophecy of Abraham. Abraham, in Genesis 25, 7, says, And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, and hundred, threescore, and fifteen, day, 15 years. 175 years old. Would you say that's a pretty long life? I'd say it's a pretty long life. It says, Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. One more prophecy fulfilled. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 16, Genesis 15, 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. Now, this is jumping back. The, the kind of 15 was thrown in there about, about Abraham, but the context of what we're reading here is talking about his children, right? It goes into in depth about how he's going to have he's going to have a child, he's going to have all these children. That's like the the you know, multitude. They're going to go into this land, they're going to be afflicted, and then they're going to be brought out of this land. So we're kind of picking back up here, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. Hither meaning where he is right now. And where he is right now in the context of this story, he's in the land of the Amorites. He's in Mamre. That is where, where Abraham is in the context of Genesis 15. He says they're going to come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God knows the way things are going to go. He's saying, you know what? The Amorites aren't quite as wicked as they need to be in order for me to bring judgment upon them. Because God brings judgment unto the, all the wicked nations of the earth. I mean, when they, when they get real bad, God destroys them. And he's saying, you know what? The Amorites, they're not there yet. So I'm not going to judge them yet. It's going to take some time before I'm going to decide enough's enough. And again, you know, by, by fulfilling the promises made to the children of Israel, giving them a promised land, at the same time, he's judging wicked nations that have gotten into all kinds of perversion, all kinds of iniquity, all kinds of wickedness, killing two birds with one stone, so, so to speak, right? I mean, he's, he's doing all this stuff simultaneously. He's saying the, the iniquity of the Amorites, Amorites is not yet fulfilled. Um, but I want to also point out there, it says the fourth generation. And this is something I never thought about. It took me a little bit of time last night to kind of figure this out. And, and I spent a little bit of time. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go over this with you because I spent too much time last night figuring out what he meant by the fourth generation. Because a generation can mean multiple things. There are different various you know, meanings you could, get, you, could, you could associate with generation. Because a generation could be like a normal lifespan of, of have from a parent to a child. So like typically a generation might be roughly around 30 years because 
an average person might have a child at the age of 30, which would then be like the next generation. That's one way of the use of the word generation. But another one is just strictly going by descendants, right? So like my father is, it could be, a, you know, my grandfather could be, a, if we call that the first generation, and my father's the second generation, I'm the third generation, and then my child is the fourth generation, right? I mean, that's another way of doing it. It's similar, but depending on how old people live, the, the timing can be a lot different, right? So he's talking about them going into Egypt and then the fourth generation coming back out. And you say, well, wait a minute. I mean, they were in Egypt for 400 years. How could that be the fourth generation? Well, here's how it's the fourth generation because it actually is the fourth generation. Israel and his children were in Egypt to begin with. So Israel, and you got the 12 tribes, right? Well, one of those is Levi. Levi could be considered the first generation that was in Egypt, right? Levi, let me put, I have all this written out just so I don't screw anything up. Oh, well, the, the return, let me just mention this first too. The, the return back into that land was when Moses defeats the Amorites. So this was a battle that Moses fought because this is before, you know, Moses didn't go fully into the promised land. This was on the other side of the river, but that's where the Amorites dwelt and that's when they defeated Heshbon, the king of Sihon. That was the king of the Amorites. So remember Og, king of Bashan and, and Heshbon, king of Sihon, those two kings that they beat, that was Moses led those battles. That, those were the Amorites, that's where they were, and that's when they came back then and got that land. So that's the fulfillment thereof. But now it's, where's the four generations? The four generations starts when they entered Egypt and ends with Moses being the fourth generation. So the, the four generations are actually spelled out in 1 Chronicles chapter 6. You could turn there if you'd like, but keep your finger in Genesis 15. We're going right back to it. 1 Chronicles chapter 6 shows us uh, the sons of Levi in verse 1. So remember, Levi was in Egypt. Sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Kohath, Amram, Izhar, and Hebron, and Uzziel. And the children of Amram, Aaron, and Moses, and Miriam. The sons also of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So we see you have Levi, you have Kohath, you have Amram, you have Moses. Four generations Levi lived to be 137 years old. He was the first generation in Egypt. Kohath lived to be 133 years old. He was the second generation. Amram lived to be 137, and Moses lived to be 120. So you can see how four generations can span 400 years pretty easily there because you've got 500 years of lifespan between those four generations. And it was near the end of Moses' life, mind you, also when they took over that land of the Amorites. So there's your four generations. And again, the word of God stands sure. Genesis 15, there's one more that I want to point out here. It's, it's, it's pretty common that, that um, I'm sure you all will just you know, know this happened, but verse 17 says, and it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. And he spells them all out way back during the time of Abraham that they weren't going to get until, you know, hundreds of years down the road. That all came to pass also. And, and I, I, I'm, you could, you know, I could prove that from Scripture, but I think that's, that's well known enough that I don't have to do so this morning. Uh, let's go to our next one, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's see, how am I doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty good on time, actually. I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to get through these quick, but not too quick. I, mean, I want to, each one of these Miracles. Each one of these prophecies being fulfilled is, is amazing in itself. When, and when you start to look at the quantity of prophecies, it's mind-boggling. And again, I had never really given much consideration to this 
as focusing in on how many prophecies really are fulfilled until I started just doing a little bit of studying for this sermon. And I just kind of took a step back and I was like, okay, because that's a cool idea. I was like, you know, I want to preach on just prophecies fulfilled in the Bible. And then it's like, whoa. I mean, there is just, I mean, it's nice for preparing a sermon because there's so much to choose from. I mean, literally, there's just so much there. And, and this is literally almost everything here was just, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, like, like here's one, here's one, here's one, just off the top of my head. Um, we're going to see a story here with Elisha and the famine. And a famine was a result of a siege when the, when the city of Jerusalem was being besieged by, uh, by an army, or in Samaria, actually. It says, uh, verse 25 here, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse number 25. For reason, there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver. Now, I don't know how much you would spend for an ass's head, but 80 pieces of silver is pretty expensive. And I don't care what age you're living in, 80 pieces of silver is going to, you know, we don't know the exact weight, but that's a lot of money. Put it this way, one piece of silver, you know, like a silver dollar, is worth about 20 bucks today, roughly. I don't know where silver's at, but, you know. So... You know, if, if, if we used our monetary, you know, to 80 pieces of silver at 20 bucks a piece, that's 1,600 bucks for an ass's head. That's a pretty bad famine. When you go to the store looking for food and meat, you know, you're not looking for an ass's head. You're looking for, you're not even looking for an ass, right? I mean, you don't eat any, any of that food. That's, that's going to be, you know, grizzly, not, you know, gamey, not, not the good type of meat you're going to be enjoying. And we're talking about an ass's head, but it gets worse. Look at, let's see what else they got going on here. An ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Wow. One fourth. Dove's dung. Hey, hey anyone want to go out after, after church this morning and, and go get some dove's dung for lunch? I don't think so let alone buying some for five pieces of silver. I mean, that's like, this is a bad famine. We're going to see how bad it gets. It's actually really sad. Verse number 26, And as the king of Israel is passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help me, Lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the wine press. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, this woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him, and she hath hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Very disturbing story. And very sad, and it's, it's hard to, to look at that and, and you know, all, not come to tears over just thinking, like, what are these people doing? But when you, when you suffer that extreme hunger, I mean, this is, they're, they're mad. Mm -hmm. They've gone mad with hunger that they're looking at their children to eat. That's a, quite a curse, and that's quite a famine. So things are not looking good at all. I mean, they've been brought down really low in the city here and what's going on. Flip over to the next chapter in chapter 7. Because this is during the time of Elisha. So Elisha's going to make a prophecy now in the midst of them being... And, and what happens is when they're besieged, the city's besieged, it means there's an invading army and they camp out and surround the city. Huge host of people. They're way too weak to fight against them. So they're going to say, you know, we're just going to hole up in our city, right? We've got our defenses. We've got our walls. They're not going to be able to break through. But one of the tactics then is that they say, okay, we're going to hang out here. We're not going to let any supplies go in and out. We're not going to let you go out and farm your land on the outside of the walls of the city. You're not going to be able to do anything. So you just have to sit there. And what they do is they just, they just wait them out, right? You just wait, wait, wait until... All their supplies dry up, all their food, dry, you know, which is exactly what's happening here. So here's the siege. The army doesn't look like they're going anywhere anytime soon. I mean, they're just camped out there, right? Very bleak situation. 
But then we have Elisha saying in chapter 7, verse 1, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. We see him spending 80 pieces of silver for an ass's head, and now he's talking about real food. I mean, flour, right, um, barley, things that you'd actually want to eat being sold for a very small denomination of money, a shekel. A shekel, you know, that's, that's something that anyone would carry around, you know, like change. He's saying, you're going to get a measure of that tomorrow. Verse 2, Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. So he doubted God's word. He was like, like is, that, is that really going to happen? You know, if God made windows in heaven, is that, is that really going to happen? He says, well, yeah, you know what? You're going to see it so that you know it's going to happen and you're not going to partake of it. Look at verse number 16. Now we're going to jump down to verse 16. We're going to see the prophecy come to pass. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. And, and what happened is I kind of skipped over the story. These lepers were inside the city. They're like, well, we're going to die if we sit here. We're lepers. No one's going to care. No one, no one cares about us anyways. Let's just fall under them. Let's just go under the enemy. And you know what? Maybe they'll kill us. And if so, so what? We're going to die here anyways. But maybe they'll just take us in. They'll take us prisoner. Take us in, and then we could just at least get some food. Right? I mean, this is what's going on in their head. So they're like, okay. They decide to go out. They go out into the camp. The camp's empty. Everything is there. Their tents are all still set up because they're camped out. You know, besieging city. Everything's there and not a person. It's just empty. And they're like, cool. So they start, you know, grabbing all this stuff and hiding it in the earth, you know, getting their, their stash together. They're like, wait a minute. You know, this is, this is good tidings. We need to let everyone else know about this. So they go back to the city, let them know. And then, um, the, the, you know, they, they determine that it's actually true. They send out a few people and say, okay, yeah, this is, this is legit. You know, this is what's happening. So the people come out. Look at verse 16 now. I just wanted to bring you up to speed in the story. Verse 16, the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord. They had so much substance there that the economy went right back to normal because they had an influx of everything that they needed. You know, obviously, when supply is low, demand is real high, prices go up. That's why the, 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 the ass's head was so expensive. Now, supply is abundant. So everybody's got stuff, so it's, it's not worth as much anymore. And that's why they're able to sell so cheap. Verse 17, And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. So he's saying, okay, you're in charge of, of you know, getting people in and out of here. People are so hungry, they're eating their own kids. You can imagine... You know, I mean, you look at the people going to Walmart on Black Friday and how they trample over people for a television. Imagine what people would do when they're in such a state that they're willing to eat their own children and that hungry for food. You've got a mob on your hands and you can't control them. I mean, there's no, all right, people, slow down, single file. Let's, you know, that, that's not going to happen. So he's in charge of the gate. And it says, And the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died, as the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. And it came to pass, as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for... And he had the price right, too. I mean, mind you, it's not just that, hey, things are going to be great, and we're going to have an abundance. The price was right. Yeah. They were being sold for that price. Like, it, it, was, it was not just a, you know, a coincidence. He had the exact monetary value correct. Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel and shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. So he saw it happen, but he ended up dying and didn't partake in it. it happened exactly the way it was said. Uh, I've got Joseph here. Um, turn if you go to Daniel chapter number four. It's the last place I'll have you turn. There's so, there's so many references. Of course, Joseph, uh, you know, rising up to his position of power along the way, 
he interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. You remember? They had their dream. They were in prison with them, and they had their own individual dreams. And Joseph said, well, here's what's going to happen to you, and here's what's going to happen to you. One of them's going to be restored back to his position. You know, the, the, the butler's going to go back to, to his place, and, his, and he's going to serve the king. But the baker, you know what? You're going to die. He's going to remove your head from off you. And exactly what he said. I mean, it's, 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 it, it rang true. Um, Daniel. Daniel interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to start reading in chapter 4, verse number 24. Here we have the account from Nebuchadnezzar himself. Saying, you know, he's saying, I had this dream. This is what happened. You know, this is what I was told. And it exactly came to pass from the first-hand account of King Nebuchadnezzar himself who it happened to. Okay, verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And where is it commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots? Thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So this was... Um, Daniel explaining the king, here's the interpretation of your dream, this is what's going to happen. And what he does, he basically explains that you're going to be like an animal. Seven times means seven years. For seven years, you're going to be like an animal. You're going to eat the grass like the oxen. You're going to be out under the dew of heaven. Now, now think about this. The, I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar, like the, 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 the ruler of the world at that time, and there's one world government, he's the king, saying... <laughs> You're going to be eating grass like an animal and left out in the field like an animal for seven years. Imagine saying that about any leader, right? Uh, you'd say you're nuts. But then he says, now imagine that's not enough that that happened. And he says, but you know what? After that time, you're going to get your kingdom back. Can you imagine a ruler that's out just literally like he's gone crazy? He's out on his hands and knees and he's eating grass like an ox and he's just staying outside. Well, he's done for sure. I mean, that guy's cuckoo. Right? I mean, that guy's woo, gone. He got his kingdom back. After seven years of being like that. Let's keep reading here. It says in verse 28, and all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, so, so a, a full year after, after this dream and after the, the, the explanation of this dream, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Lift it up really high in pride. We know what God thinks about that. Verse 31, While the word was in the king's mouth, he was just finishing saying this, making a sentence. There fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Those words sound real familiar, don't they? It sounds pretty exact what Daniel just told him a year prior was going to happen. I mean, word for word. Like he's just saying, this is what's going to happen. And now he hears it from heaven. The same hour, verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, think about it, for seven years, just being out in, in the atmosphere, in the dew, in the, you know, just outside, 
and literally like his hair started becoming like you know real coarse and feathery and 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 nasty and nappy and you know just from the outside and his nail i mean he was he's not grooming himself he's not keeping himself because he turned into like an animal so his nails grew out so he's got like these claws and his and his hair's all wild and, and turning into the feathers and uh, it says at, in verse 34 and at the end of the days i nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. So you're saying at the end of the time, after seven years, because that's what was prophesied, is that this is going to happen to you for seven times. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Amen. He's humbled. He was lifted up high to heaven, like his dream said. And he was chopped down and brought really, really low until he could understand, you know what? I'm not as high as my, in my as I thought I was. God's in charge. God rules. He's, you know, I'm not going to charge God and say, what do you think you're doing? Right? What doest thou? He's going to do what he's, what he's going to do. And I'm going to just step back and, and say, you're right, God. I'm wrong. Verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. And notice, now he's saying the majesty was added unto him. He's not saying, for my majesty, I'm ruling and reigning and have this great Babylon. He's saying, well, it was given to me now, and, and, and I was put back in this position, and, and majesty was added to me, and, and, and people, you know, like, recognizing it's a gift that was given to him. That's not because of who he was. It, was. it was given to him for God's purposes. Verse number 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are true, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. So, again, I mean, it's prophecy after prophecy. This is Nebuchadnezzar himself. Who's, 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 that's why it says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar. Like, like, this is what Daniel said to me. This is the dream I had. And this is what happened. And I was out there like a beast. And he said, I looked up to heaven after seven years. And I looked up. And then all of a sudden, I got back in my right mind. My understanding came back. And, this, and he's like, now I know. Like, this is, <laughs> there's a God in heaven. And, and, and he's the one that's able to lift up and cast down. So those are all the examples I have. You could go through the, the entire book of Ezekiel. You could go through the entire book of Isaiah. There are prophecies against the nations, against Moab, against Ammon, against, you know, like, like just literally go down Tyre, against Sidon. And, and, and the prophecies are made against all these various nations in these books of the prophets. And they all have come to pass exactly as they were written. Literally, all of the prophets have prophecies that have come to pass. That's why they're in the Bible. That's why it's considered Scripture. That's why it's God's Word, because they've been proven that, yes, thus saith the Lord, because it all came to pass. How do we know who is a prophet? Because the things they prophesy in the name of the Lord come to pass without fail. What an awesome God. And, you know, we know that we have to have faith in order to be saved. We know that that faith is the key thing. But God didn't leave us to a point of ridiculousness of how could you possibly believe in God and believe in Jesus? There's, there is so much ample evidence to be reasonable to, to just say, you know what? Yeah. This happened, and this is true. We see these, these prophecies being fulfilled. We know it's coming from God. You can't get around. All, you, know, you can look at even nature. You know, in, in Romans 1, it explains that, you know, the, that the, the invisible things are, 
are um, under, clearly understood by the things that are made. You know, that, that it, the God's eternal power and Godhead could be seen and understood just through nature, looking at, you know, I explain this all the time to people, right? This is my last point. We live in a complicated ecosystem and world and the way that everything works. And if you just bring things down to just a real basic elementary form and you say, so you're not going to believe in God, but you're going to believe in, 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 in this alternate explanation of how we got here, which I don't know if anyone else believes anything other than either God or evolution. As far as I know, there's not any other explanations that I've heard. Nothing that's really popular, at least, that people believe in. Evolution is, is debunked so easily. Just by the fact, and I point this out because you don't have to know tons of science. You don't have to know all this stuff. You could just use basic reasoning skills if you know a little bit. If you know that there are plants that are required for certain insects to survive, and there are insects that require those same plants, and they have a symbiotic relationship, and they both feed off of each other, and they need one another. The plants need the insects to, to pollinate, and the, the, the insects need the plants in order to, to get their food, right, and their, and their sources. In the evolutionary theory, they would both have to arise simultaneously in order to be able to, to reproduce and to continue on and to not just die off because there's, you know, and you can say, oh, but they change slowly over time. You still need to have the point to where they're doing, you know, like they're, they're working back and forth. Without excuse. Without excuse. There is no excuse for it. You can, I mean, it's, it's, and, and besides the fact that you can't ever show anywhere any evidence of, of that building up to that point to where they have this symbiotic relationship. That's one small example. You can look into our bodies. You can look into the organs. You can look at the way everything functions. It's a master design. I love these. We got these old Moody Science Classics videos from like the 70s, I think, 70s or 80s. And, uh, and this guy, uh, Warren Moon, I think is his name. And he uses the KJV and he's right spot on with salvation. He get in, and he ties in a lot of science with scripture. It's an awesome series. And I remember this one example that he gives. He's like, if you're walking in the desert and you came across a watch, right? One of those little pocket watches. Wouldn't you normally, the, 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 the reasonable question be, well, I wonder who made this, not... Wow, isn't that amazing? After all these years of just being in the desert, this watch appeared. Obviously, there's gears in place. There's everything there it has a meaning. It's recording time. You can see, you, know, you study it long enough, you see this has a purpose. This actually has a function. It's doing something. Someone intelligently created this and designed it for a purpose. All of creation is like that. Faith in God's word is not unreasonable. There are so many prophecies that have been fulfilled. And not just that, it makes sense. Amen. The alternate explanations are foolishness. Praise God for His Word. Amen. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for you for you are who you are dear lord and and for your truth and for your wisdom and and for the sharing that with us dear god and revealing us the, the things that you've revealed unto us dear lord uh we thank you so much for for our salvation for making things easy on us for giving us eternal life as a free gift dear lord that, that all we have to do is to look at your words and believe them it's not that hard to do i don't know why there's so many people that want to fight it and resist it dear lord and resist the truth but it's, it's, it's there, and it's plain, dear Lord. And if we could just use a little bit of reason in, in ourselves, we could look at this stuff and say, this is too perfect to not have been from you. There's too many things that have to fall into place when we look at the Bible as a whole for man to be able to be capable of such perfection in, in creating a collection of books written over various time periods to, to not have any errors, dear Lord. We thank you so much. For, for revealing his words to us and making yourself known unto us, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to uh, spread the word, to spread the faith, to, to help people, to point people to Jesus Christ for their salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.